Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we have the honor of speaking to Darius Kamali. Darius is a former analyst with the State Department Supported International Monitor Institute, the visual evidence wing for several tribunals on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. He transitioned to political documentary, then to television and feature animation producing in Hollywood as executive producer on a number of movies recently. The global pandemic provided the opportunity, like it has done for so many people, to change things around and the catalyst for Kamali to return to his roots and his passion with two genre bending, timely, timely, thought provoking, critically acclaimed books. First one titled Mistake of Identity, and the second one, Dog Whistling Dixie Past the Graveyard. First of all, welcome aboard Politics Done Right, Darius. How are you doing today? Doing great. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Excellent. Barely recognize myself with that uh, intro there. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, you, you, you're, you're an important man with many, with many, many different, what should I say, many different options. Okay. Many different hats. How about that? Many yeah. different hats. That's what, yeah. you know, you know, sometimes you're looking for that word that just doesn't come to you. <laughs> a word as simple as H-A-T-S, hats. There you go. All right, let's get busy. Why mistaken identity? Why dog whistling Dixie past the graveyard? One of them actually seems sort of poetic. Uh, interesting that you say that. Uh, you know, I don't know if people have defined both of these as uh, poetic, but I'm not sure if they're traditional poetry. They're not traditional anything. Uh, I would say uh, they're maybe uh, genre benders is the best way that's, to describe that's how we them. Named it, yeah. There you go. Without describing them, there, in very broadly speaking, you, there is some poetry, especially in dog whistling Dixie past the graveyard, which obviously is a term that's composed of three different uh, expressions. There, that's uh, somewhat lyrical, but I would say they combined uh, combined several genres. One of them is. Uh, the, in the Eastern tradition, there's such a thing as a, a Zen Cohen, right? Mm -hmm. which is meant to be a, a riddle and a, a brain breaker to take you to another level of understanding. Uh, then there's also the tradition that we had in the 19th century in the United States, which people have forgotten about, the aphoristic tradition. Um, and of course, uh, they're partly contemporary tweet, uh, you know, with uh, people's attention spans these days. Uh, I think it's a it's a good fit, and uh, I didn't plan it that way. I was um, during the pandemic just writing down some of my thoughts and and putting them down um, on social media, but sometimes in hidden formats, so only I would see them, mm -hmm. <laughs> just so that they're not lost. Well, it's and your story. Later, it was your story. It was your cloud. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And and later, I I realized you know there's enough here to categorize. And, and put out there uh, as, you know, books or they're small books or uh, light reading in the sense that, you know, you can come back to them and, and go through them very quickly. But uh, hopefully uh, in terms of um, uh, content, uh, uh, a little heavier than that. Well, I mean, it, uh, from what I've read of it, it's some of it, it, it's not heavy. I mean, it's, you can write, you can write heavy stuff in a form that makes it palatable to read. In other words, you want to put things in, in some sort of a format that educates, illustrates, but at the same time, you want to read. And that's what I think. I think that is where you're trying to go, if you will. Yeah, no, thank you. That's that's exactly it. And you know what? I didn't sit and, and decide I'm going to devote this much time to writing these books. They were just ideas that came to me. Uh, and obviously, they're informed by my background, by my personal experience of both my ethnic experience, my professional experience, both in Hollywood and before that in human rights, uh, NGO world. And so, you know, uh, it, it's a culmination of um, my entire um, life's experience uh, in, to some extent. And, to, and when you said timely, it's interesting. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it seems that they're timely, right? It seems like some it of these uh, timely yeah. issues uh, have been with us forever and in a sense maybe at least the issues are timeless mm -hmm. well let, let me let me uh first of all you, you talk about it, it a lot of this is drawn from your experience why don't you tell us a little bit about you before we get into because I, i'm going to want to hit up the topic on identity and hit up the topic on uh, on uh what, what's the word um to take you out what, what's the, what's a famous word that we're using today i don't know what's wrong with my mind today 
Uh, it woke. It woke raced in you. Is that Woke-ness one? Well, there's so many. In you. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, one word that I use is so many di- directions to come at it. Go ahead. No, I'm saying before that, tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself. Oh, sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, I've sort of had uh, three phases to my career, and it looks on the surface that they're unrelated. And in a sense, they are, except that I went through all of them. Uh, I, I originally started in uh, human rights, you could say. I worked as an analyst for some uh, something called the International Monitor Institute, which was an NGO, a non-governmental organization. However, um, it turned out that we started getting government money. Uh, so that's a whole other story. And I got to see as a green young man how it is that the government can actually step in and, and control you, uh, not by sending you to Siberia necessarily, but just waving some money, all right? And from that point onward, it, it amazingly turned out that uh, uh, they had a say-so in what we, will, what we should concentrate on and what we shouldn't, to put it that way. Mm-hmm. So I got to see that uh, firsthand and transitioned from there. I was an analyst for uh, War Crimes Tribunal, I should put it that way. The IMI was the visual evidence wing for some tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, the ethnic cleansing and genocide that went on there, uh, and for Iraq. And that was my specialty, Iraq, the former Ba'athist regime and and Saddam Hussein. Uh, From there, I transitioned to documentaries. First, you know, more, um, you could say political documentaries or human rights related, child soldier, so on and so forth. And I discovered that as my role grew, from originally just a researcher to then becoming, you know, segment producer, associate producer, a field producer, whatever these titles were, that the nature of the documentaries became more and more commercial, right? And um, that's, you know, bound to happen here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And then I transitioned entirely into the uh, something else, which is the world of animation with a film called Igor, the first uh, animated feature film that was made by an independent rather than by a studio back in 2008. We've done a couple of more since then for Netflix and Amazon Prime and really was tied up in that world and um, augmented reality as well up up until the pandemic when I had some uh, time on my hands suddenly that was forced on me like so many others. And that allowed me to really decide to go back to my roots, which is ideas. You know, I was a Mm -hmm. philosophy major and a person uh, interested in in the root of, of issues rather than just the surface uh, momentary Deeper. politics of it. Yeah, and so, you know, the pandemic gave me an opportunity. Um, in fact, uh, the, the story that I usually tell is that, you know, I, I discovered myself recently that the word radical uh, is an ancient, <laughs> do you know where I'm going with this? Yes. Yeah, is an is a ancient um, Latin and ultimately Greek word, which means the root. And so uh, in that sense, uh, I would describe these books as radical, the sense that they're trying to get to the root of the issue rather than just the surface momentary politics of the day and the particular mask or or jargon. Now, how do you describe identity in in America? Well, uh, I would say it's, I don't know if uh, I would describe it as any different in America as anywhere else. I think it's, I think it's, deeply ingrained in us, including myself. You know, I don't exempt myself from any of this. Uh, I think it's a way for us, even perhaps at a biological level, to differentiate, you know, maybe at a genetic level. But once you associate with a certain group based on any characteristic you choose, then anyone that doesn't share that particular uh, characteristic is the out group, right? And so my one of my fundamental sort of ideas here is that I'm fine with concentrating on the specifics, black versus white, you know, gay versus straight, whatever, nation versus nation, tribe versus tribe. And we can play that game and, and, and I'm happy to play that game. But ultimately, unless we see that these are just all manifestations of a larger term called groupism, I, I'm calling it groupism. And mm-hmm. it's an inelegant term, but I haven't found a better term that encompasses all of these things then we're just playing um, a sort of, uh, I say this in one of the books, I forget which one, uh, a sort of a musical chairs. If anyone remembers that game from childhood. Who's, in, who's the one that's left out? 
That's right. Who's the one? That's right. And so, uh, you know, uh, we can concentrate on, is it the people with the blue mask that are going to be standing up when the music stops or the people with the red masks? But ultimately, wouldn't it be better if we just added a couple of more chairs? Uh, rather than, <laughs> uh, so a positive solution rather than a, a negative solution based on need. Uh, and that seems obvious when put that way, but unfortunately, I, I think it's not so obvious um, the way our, our brains and our psychology is constructed. And why don't, why don't you think we put the other two chairs? Well, you know, there's, there's times where you can't, right? There are, there's actual limits to goods and services and so on and so forth sometimes. But I, so, you know, I make a distinction between discriminations that are necessary, hypothetically, and I'm not saying which one, and, and those that are not. Uh, at the very, very beginning of Mistake of Identity, I, I write something that, that's proven to be very controversial because, you know, the, the left doesn't let, like Let me hear one. it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically, uh, and I'm paraphrasing it poorly here, but an idea that I had back in my college days that, let's say a, a teacher, a professor, is, has uh, five slots, 10 slots, whatever the case may be, to take 10 students on a field trip. And it's really 10, you, it can't be any more. And, and, you know, if the teacher were to say, I'm going to, you know, draw straws or pick, you know, balls out of a, a hat, whatever the case may be, people would be okay with that in a sense. They would still be upset if they're left out, but they wouldn't feel that they were left out, particularly because of, let's say, Some race. Or, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they wouldn't say it's unfair. But what is it that makes that process okay it's random and what is random but arbitrary well what if i were to say what if the teacher were to say well i'm going to take the, the african americans in the group because there's 10 of them happens to be it's precisely because it doesn't matter precisely because their, their race is as should be ideally as irrelevant as a random draw mm -hmm. now everybody would be up in arms of course no, no, you're doing it because you're racist. And maybe he is doing it because he's racist, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be that he actually doesn't even- You know, that, that's a difficult one, right? Because- You see um, what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I mean, how do you interpret that? I mean, if, if, if you could be pure and saying that the, given that we want race to be relevant, just using that as a discriminating factor because you only have 10 slots would be okay. But in today's society, that, that sort of a analysis is- it's catered by history, right? Yeah, no, 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 no question. Uh, no question, because then you would have to show, first of all, was it a necessary discrimination or was the teacher just being, you know, <laughs> uh, did he actually have a bias there? Right. And that's, and, and so, but, but, but that example is, is simply to make the, the case that ideally that's what it would be, right? And, you know, I, I, at first when you said it, it kind of, you know, I can't, it, I, it, it held me aback, but I'm an engineer. So when I looked at it from a numerical point of view, it's like, okay, when they're doing it randomly, why, I mean, again, if we claim that we should all be race, race biased, we could say, well, we'll take all the, you know, so I see your point. I, act, I actually yeah, see no, your point. I'm glad you said, uh, because to me, uh, I'm glad you said uh, you're an engineer and you see it numerically, because that's actually the perspective that it's coming from. There's a theory in the moral philosophy and ethics of uh, utilitarianism, and there's mm -hmm. multiple variations of it, but it ultimately has to do with, you know, maximizing happiness for the largest number of people, assuming that all souls are equal, right? Mm -hmm. All else being equal. And so from that perspective, again, if five people are left out, five people are left out. And right. if you are more upset by the fact that those five people happen to share an arbitrary characteristic, then I would say you're the groupist. <laughs> right. but, so it's counterintuitive. I understand this. And it can be abused. And it has been abused. But once we see that that may actually be, at least from a utilitarian perspective, the, the, the ideal, then it uh, sheds a new light, right? Because the alternative is what? The alternative is, is for one group, um, again, uh, to, to feel aggrieved. And it's not just one group. Everyone can come up with things that, that have happened to them. And, and, and not incorrectly, these things have happened and are happening. I don't mean to minimize that one bit or say that it's not correct. The issue is what's the solution? Right. What's the solution? So that we don't end up in the same boat next year and the year after that and the year after that. 
And I believe that, you know, mystics, whether it's in the Western tradition or the Eastern tradition, have always sort of seen this. This is not a new idea at all. But is it possible to apply this concept of a soul is a soul is a soul to our politics uh, without it being we, misused by the right to just keep people down? Don't you think we could if, uh, if, if it weren't such an effective tool? Because my contention, and if you, if you, I don't know how much of my show you've ever watched, but my contention is that uh, there, that our economic system and our, et cetera needs to have us at each other's throats in other words, in, in order to thrive. Because uh, if you are, if you actually stop looking at you and me as the enemy, we start looking at the economic system, the design of the economic system as the real enemy. Because again. In what economic system can the few profit from the many and the many just accept it? I don't disagree with that. In fact, I, I'm completely uh, you know, on your side, in, if, if you put it that way. I think that groupism is used by the powerful to set people against each other mm -hmm. uh, and distract them from the fact that we're all essentially being robbed blind. Right. 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 And, uh, you know, I, I, and I, my issue is that people who are ideologically, and I, this is the, in the American context now, specifically today, uh, hung up on party, on Democrat versus Republican. And I'm not saying there isn't differences between them. There are. But hung up to that, to the extent that it becomes another groupism where they can't see, they can't judge a case uh, an issue case by case on its merits. They judge it more either uh, instinctively or consciously or unconsciously based on, is that my group doing this or not? Mm -hmm. um, if, if we have time, if I could just jump into the Ukraine-Russia thing for a moment. As I, an example. I, I tell you what, hold yeah. that thought right there because sure. I want to bring you, now that you talk about the Democrat-Republican thing, right now, I... I <laughs> I'm a Democrat because I caucus with the Democrats, but I'm a Bernie Sanders yeah. kind of guy because <laughs> that is where you can actually, in our current today, it's where you can affect policy. If I were in the 60s, I would probably be a Republican because that is where policy was effective to bring, let's say, civil rights, except for Johnson, who was a Democrat. It was a lot of Republicans that brought- uh, That's right, they switched. Them. Right, so I mean, so what I'm saying is for me, it's not about party. For me, it's about getting effective solutions. And to do that right now, it doesn't occur. In, and there's a particular party where it doesn't occur in. And that's the only reason I would call myself a Democrat. I just wanted to put that. Yeah, no, I, that. I, I understand. In fact, I have uh, had the thoughts, and I'm not the only one in the last several years, that the old notions of Democrat, Republican being left and right are really outdated in this Completely, country. Completely, because there are neoliberals and all that. You have Absolutely. To get all that picture. A neoliberal is, a Democrat is no different than a, a, a neoliberal Republican. A Republican. Absolutely. A, a Hillary Clinton, you know, type of Democrat to, to you know, name names here, or neoliberal. Or, I, I, in fact, I think the neocons and neoliberals are, are the they're, same. They're all and in the same. And they, they just have different bases that they have to support, right? That's and, right. And they, I always talk about them being the rails. In other words, the left rail and the right rail. They keep this, they, 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 they both move in the same direction, right? You have two rails, you have a left rail That's and a right. right rail, but guess what? They're yeah. moving in the same direction. Yeah, it's a good cop, bad cop. It's a yeah, shocking job. Yeah, it's a, but anyway, right. I, 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 you wanted to bring in Ukraine. It seems like we're going to move this, <laughs> this interview in a in more of a conversational type. So go ahead and move it on because this is not in your book. So let's have it. Sure. Yeah. No, no. I mean, uh, it's, it's unavoidable right now. I have very conflicted views on this because obviously no question what's going on is horrific. No, no. I mean, doesn't really need to be said. Any kind of aggression, war, uh, refugees, people being killed uh, is, is a horror show. Uh, the issue that I have with our media, our Western media as a whole and its coverage is that it seems so suddenly, suddenly aware of things that our own government is doing on a regular basis as policy. I mean, as we speak, uh, what's happening in Ukraine is happening in Yemen by the Saudis, backed by the United States. The United States is helping them with arms, money, intelligence, uh, backing uh, groups like Al-Qaeda uh, and ISIS uh, in Yemen. And we've done the same thing in Iraq and 
in, in Afghanistan, in Syria. I can name a hundred examples from the Monroe Doctrine onwards, right? And it's so amazing that despite all of this, you know, having come out for years now in academia, that the media can so quickly, so quickly just become the lapdogs, in my opinion, of the Pentagon and White House and CIA and, uh, once again. Again, this is not to diminish what's happening in Ukraine. That's real. But it's it's just astonishing to me that there's no self-consciousness going on, you know, self-awareness that what the Russians are doing is very similar, unfortunately, to what the United States has done and does on a regular Darius, basis as I policy. I am impressed, may I say. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from Panama, Central America, 1989. You know. Brother Bush, older Bush, sent the military in there, killed over 10,000 Panamanians. It's reported as 4,000 some places, 1,000 as others. It is no different than uh, how the Russians indiscriminately kill to get what they want. They wanted Manuel Antonio Noriega. They got Manuel Antonio Noriega at the expense of 10,000 Panamanians. So Absolutely. yes, they all the superpowers do the same thing. And I'm glad that you, you, you coined it exactly as I've done in several of my programs. We must go ahead and state that Russia is doing a horrendously evil thing, but let's, let's use that and put that in context to what happened in Granada, to what happened in Panama, to what happened in El, uh, Santo Domingo, to what happened, and we can name, you, you, you actually went overseas. We don't even have to go overseas. We Vietnam, can stay right, right here. Right here. Yeah. yeah. We can stay right here. You know, there's so, a, uh, and uh, a, I don't know if he's an anthropologist by trade or a sociologist, but he's a famous writer by the name of Jared Diamond here at UCLA, uh, close to where I live. And uh, he wrote something that I agree, I agree with strongly some years back. Uh, he did a description of all the genocides and ethnic cleansings and, and that have happened just over the last hundred years. And he uh, pointed out that uh, in terms of the media coverage, when it's the out group that's doing the aggression and the victim is the in group, then the media of the in group goes nuts, as they should. When it's the in group committing the atrocities, it's minimized, it's, uh, it's uh, ignored, uh, it's even encouraged, unfortunately. Uh, and when it's two groups that you don't really care about, it's sort of neutral. It, the media barely pays any attention. Well, to I mean, it. I'm glad that you use. I, I'm glad that you brought up the latter because there was somebody who asked. I don't remember what, what interview. Uh, when one of these right wingers were really attacking Biden for you know Biden's response, and the other guy said, "How come we're just talking about this? This is happening all over the world right now. You're not oh, actually." It was an interview with that. Uh, the redhead that I really like the way she answers questions because she's so good at it. And that is uh, Jen Psaki being interviewed at the White House. Uh, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's a Jen White Psaki, House yeah. spokesperson. And they, they asked her about, uh, you know, Yemen and all of that. And she came out and she honestly said it. I don't think the people in Yemen would think it's, it's not relevant. I don't think the people in Ethiopia would think that it's not relevant, that we are not going in there and fighting on their behalf. Yeah, so absolutely. why should we go in and fight on the behalf of Ukraine? Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's horrendous to see the kids that Russia is killing. It's horrendous to see the destruction that's going on. But I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think that um, uh, in the book, I say something along these lines. I think the moment you start to care about another person that you don't know, I add the term you don't know because... Clearly, if, if it's a family member or a friend, we're going to be biased, and that's just natural. But all else being equal, if something, the moment I care more about someone who I don't know in uh, Botswana, more or less than someone I don't know in Milwaukee, that's already the beginning of the end. Uh, there's, there's no coming out, you know, there's no solution to that game. And of course, we all do feel that way, whether we say it or not. If you put it that way, people realize, well, it's unfair. But at the same time, every country says America first or Russia first, whatever the case. Why Russia first? Why America first? Uh, now, if it's because of an actual ideology, I'm all for that. I get it. I'm not one of these hippy dippies, as they say, you know, I don't think all ideologies are the same. I don't think cultures are the same. In fact, I'm all for cultures competing with each other. 
and, and showing that they may be better for the human condition than another culture. But that gets conflated and confused with the arb arbitrary characteristics that we did not choose. So when someone says I'm a Christian or a Muslim, how often is it that they've actually studied these things and come up with a rational decision as an adult? I would respect that much more. But almost always, it's, it happens to be where they were born. It's an identity. It's an, it's an identity uh, and, and not so much a, a, a chosen uh, ideology. Yeah, absolutely. So let me let me tell you, uh, Darius, we've we've gone through a whole lot. We've taken the uh, let, let me first tell you, whenever you come to politics done right, I always give the latitude to the to my guests to take the conversation wherever they want to take it. But they must remember that we do uh, we are in a limited time space when we speak. Um, I think what everything that you've said been ingenious. I think folks need to go ahead and pick up the, your, your book is sort of on the philosophical, good type of reading type of a deal. I think folks should go ahead and um, pick up both, both, both of your books because it's worth a read. And if you listen to, if you listen to what you have to say, I am so sure that people are going to enjoy this. So what would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? Well, you've done a good job here. Uh, you know, I would, uh, I, I would end with um, a sort of a, uh, I guess, an, a, a, a paradoxical analogy. Uh, you know, in our language, in our syntax, in our grammar, we use the term, we say that I have a body, right? We, we don't mm -hmm. say I am a body. Mm -hmm. And we also say I have a brain. Again, we don't use the possessive uh, we use the possessive. I have a brain. We don't say I am a brain. We don't say we are. We say we. It is ours. Yeah. Have a possess. That's right. right. And even more strangely, we even say I have a mind. Mm -hmm. We don't say I am a mind. And now that's sort of weird, isn't it? Because what is the thing that has the mind if it's not the mind itself? Mm -hmm. I would say whatever that thing is is identical in you and in me. Right. Our experiences. Our bodies. Our memories are different, but the thing that has, that experiences these things, that ultimate subjectiveness is identical. Uh, and that's actually, I'll hold up the book here. Uh, the symbol on this book, uh, which means Atman in Hinduism, uh, in that sense, we're all one. And if we can spiritually realize that while we are playing these political games and these cultural games, that you know that I know that you know that ultimately we didn't choose this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that might uh, sh do a little bit in, in unraveling this tangled mess we have in our politics, uh, both domestically and internationally. You know, um, let me first say before I close out, Darius, I think that was, that was excellent. That is, I think if we can get people to think there, to think like that, realize that these are just, you know, color, identity, and all of that. While I believe we have to play identity politics until identities are no, no longer matter, it will no longer matter if we adapt exactly how... Absolutely. Uh, but by the way, I, I, I agree with that point as well. I don't think you should unilaterally disarm. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Darius Kamali, it's been my pleasure to have you on the show. The name of the two books, and I'm repeating them here because I, 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 I you know, I, I want, I, I, this is the kind of thought process I want more Americans to have. Mistake of Identity and Dog Whistling Dixie Pass the Graveyard. It's been my honor to have you on Politics Done Right. Darius Kamali. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.